How are we able to communicate with spirits? How are we able to communicate with souls that have passed on from this life? Today we're going to look into the scientific aspect of it. We're going to listen to Dr. Gary Schwartz from the University of Arizona talk about this afterlife research. I hope you're interested in this. It is super important. Um, if you were murdered, mm. but you're now on the other side, should you be allowed to be able to testify at your own trial? Because remember, you can now do so with the soul phone. And then you would be cross-examined just like anyone else would be so that your voice could be heard. Because very often people are killed, but they don't, we don't really know details of what happened and, and so on and so forth. This is Dr. Gary Schwartz, and he is a professor at the University of Arizona. He is a Harvard-educated professor that does afterlife research. This is super important, guys. He works with spirits like Tesla, Einstein, Harry Houdini, Thomas Edison. Let's take a listen at what he has to say. And now I will bring back to you, I think, we think he is the scientist of the future. For those who love science and appreciate it, we introduce to you Dr. Schwartz. Thank you so much for being here again, Dr. Schwartz. Oh, it is such a privilege to be with you. What would you like to share with us, Dr. Schwartz, the latest news about your studies? Wow. And as you know, one of the things we've been focusing on is work developing technology to make it possible to detect and communicate with, quote, spirit. Um, we call it, quote, the soul phone. Oh. And we have a website uh, called the soul phone foundation dot org or just soul phone. S-O-U-L-P-H-O-N-E dot org, which will take you to that website. And what we've been doing is we've been using state of the art electromagnetic technology with uh, special software that we've developed to make it possible to detect the presence of what we now refer to as post material persons, as opposed to calling them spirits or souls or discarnates or um, entities, or there are many different words. The term post material is one that's becoming more widely thought of again in the academic world but the thing that i'm most area that i'm most devoted to um, and consumes most of my conscious energy is the soul phone technology oh. so for example um i have a new paper that's coming out in the journal explore the journal of science and healing which is also the journal that you mentioned in that past life paper that I had the privilege to be a co-author. And this is describing a completely computer automated, multi-blinded, multi-center, randomized control trial oh my gosh. to document the presence of post-material participants, collaborators, and potential communication. And very briefly, just to show how sophisticated the science has become, with our, our team on the other side, we call them sometimes affectionately our test pilots, mm. um, they, uh, they um, in the in the research, they will meet with a particular medium, a laboratory research medium, such as actually my wife, Rhonda, who's become very good at this. Um, and then she will instruct a group of them on a given night to show up at one of two laboratories. So the laboratory is either at the University of Arizona, for example, and another one, uh, let's say, is in Ohio. Which is where we have a 
a satellite, a laboratory, satellite laboratory. Okay? And these two laboratories are collecting data all night. So the research is run in the middle of the night when no one is physically present. No one in the physical is physically yeah. present. And all of the instructions and all of the data collection is done by computer. So the computer speaks, the computer puts slides up, and then ex explains to our team whose turn it is to participate with the equipment and who is then going to collect data. We have four um, members of our spirit team, our PMPs, and each of them participate in the experiment four times. So we collect 16 sessions of data in a single night. Now, I, for example, am responsible for maintaining the equipment at the University of Arizona site. And my colleague, Dr. Mark Pitstick, he is responsible for maintaining the equipment in Ohio. However, neither one of us know which laboratory this, our PMPs are going to on a given night. We are called blind. Um, so we don't know on a given night whether the team is going to be coming to our laboratory or we're going to the other laboratory. So if they're going to the University of Arizona, it means that the Ohio laboratory is collecting control data. It's like a placebo. And if they go to the Ohio laboratory, then the University of Arizona laboratory is collecting data as a, quote, placebo. And we run 24 nights of this very sophisticated experiment, collecting all of this data. And it's not until all the data have been collected, with all of the security and everything else that's put into this, that the code is then broken. Mm. And we determine whether or not the particular technology that we're using to detect the presence of spirit reveals their presence. So it's... A, it's the gold standard of biomedical research mm -hmm. is the randomized control trial. Yeah. The blinded, smoked, and randomized control trial. Now, the kind of task that we're using is, I, I just love it. I, I always get excited when I describe it. Because one of the questions that people ask us is, well, how do you know that it's really the people on the other side that you think it is? Mm -hmm. So, for example... I will share one of the names. One of the, one of our um, um, hypothesized post-material participants, collaborators, is um, the distinguished physicist from the 20th century, Dr. David Bohm. Mm. And uh, the question is, well, how do we know it's really David Bohm? So the test, the task that we use is a laboratory version of a personal identification test. It's the same kind of a test that we use when we do online banking. You know, the computer will ask us, well, you know, what's your mother's maiden name? You know, where did you grow up? You know, things that would identify you that you would know and most people wouldn't know. So what we do is we create a test that's specific for David, mm -hmm. that asks a series of questions that he would know, and half of those questions fit him, and the other half don't, so he can answer yes for half of them and no for the other half of them. And if it's really David who's trying to take the test, not only will David pass the test, because he'll get the correct ones correct and the incorrect ones He'll say no to the ones that are supposed to be no and yes to the ones that he should be able to be sufficiently accurate so he can, quote, pass the test and also break through to reach the statistical significance. And we have this identification test for each of our hypothesized spirits. So not only does it prove that we can detect our collaborators under these ultra-controlled procedures, but in the process, they've also definitively identified themselves as definitive as any, you know, online personal identification task could be. And 
The paper that's coming out in the next couple of months describes that method with the preliminary data. And then we've completed large scale validation studies of this, like for 24 sessions and so on, multiple times. And that paper has now been submitted to a mainstream journal. And our fingers are crossed of hope that, you know, maybe it'll be deemed sufficiently um, uh, of quality and so on yeah. to pass muster and be published. So that's an amazing bar to reach. And for someone like me, who was not raised in a spiritual tradition, as you know, I mean, I was raised in a in a a religious, essentially atheist home, yeah. um, and I was raised in Western science. I mean, I had to. It's science that has taken me to spirit. Science has taken me to spirituality. Science has taken me to source, to God, and so on. And when I look at the totality of the data now, I no longer have an excuse to disbelieve. Wow. In order for me to have integrity given the blessing that I've had of being part of so much of this data and literally witnessing it with my own eyes. Mm -hmm. For the sake of integrity um, and responsibility, I have to conclude that I'm 99.9% .9 certain as a scientist that all of this and more is real. Now, if I put on my scientist hat, the way I'll frame it, you know, for my colleagues is that um, the simplest and most, most parsimonious explanation that accounts for the largest amount of the data is survival of consciousness and personality after physical death and so on. That's how I would say it when I put my scientist hat on. Yes. When I put on my non-scientist lay hat, I say the other side is real. <laughs> and that, that I don't have an excuse to disbelieve anymore. And now the goal is to, to, to take something that is definitive proof of concept and develop it into definitive proof of practice or a product. So what we're now doing is trying to take something that takes many hours of data collection mm -hmm. to be, to establish statistically that spirit is real. So it's like, for example, it might take 25 minutes or more to be able to get a yes or no response because you have to collect so much data with all this averaging. We want to go from, from, from 25 minutes to 25 seconds and ideally just a couple of seconds to get a yes or a no. And if you could do that with 99% certainty, then you have a practical technology for texting because you can then make a soul keyboard and once you have a soul keyboard so that now they can text with us and we can text with them. Oh, wow. Now it becomes, now everything changes. Yeah. And that's the path that we're on right now. Whoa. So I have a few questions. When you say soul phone in Brazil, not only in Brazil, but the spiritists have been talking about transcommunication. That's the same, yes. right? Historically, the work has been called instrumental transcommunication. And, and people have been using whatever technology they had available at the time. Radio, television, um, microphones. People just tried whatever they had and hoped that spirit could somehow yeah. learn how to use that technology. That's not what we're doing. What we're doing is we are beginning with a scientific theoretical framework mm -hmm. about the nature of energy and information, bridging from quantum physics through what's called dynamical systems theory. And we're making specific predictions about how a post-material person's Info energy body 
Um, okay. How it interacts with, for example, um, uh, for example, attracting electrons. To what extent do, does their, you know, our bodies attract electromagnetic fields? We quote conduct electricity. Yeah. Well, in principle, their bodies should attract electrons and um, conduct electricity as well, in theory. Yeah. It's just that their level is going to be minuscule yeah. compared to ours. So what you have to do is you have to build technology that is extraordinarily sensitive on the one hand uh -huh. and is also extremely effective at filtering out noise. It's called the signal to noise problem yeah. or challenge. And then, because we're doing this based on biophysics, mm -hmm. you know, ultra weak signal biophysics, it's not like the spirit has to figure out how to make the equipment do anything. All they have to do is use the skills that they already have. So, for example, um, with the uh, the work that I was telling you about, uh, with the that ultimately led to the randomized control trial research, mm -hmm. we're using a very sophisticated application of a piece of technology that is very sensitive and that is actually commercially available. But we've but it's based on the principle that if you make contact with it or you're near it, it attracts electrons. And this is what's called a plasma globe, oh. which uses what's called, called a, a Tesla coil. And they're, they're novelty items. I mean, you'll, you'll, if, you t if you touch the outside globe, you'll see the plasma streams mm -hmm. being attracted to your finger. And if you don't attach it and you put it into an enclosure, we've shown that sophisticated averaging the electrons will still be attracted to your hand, eh? even though you can't tell it by looking at it per se. So just to finish this comment, so what happens if a member of our spirit team takes their info energy hand and places it on top of the globe or even places it inside the globe? We should be able to pick up a measurable change in the plasma dynamics and you see it's not like they're trying to figure out how do i make the microphone work or how do i make somehow the mm -hmm. the uh, the the this the uh, the radio signal produce a sound that they takes hours and hours and hours of them to try to practice now all they have to do is do is use their bodies like they normally do and it's up to the technology to detect their presence so that's what's different between the historic work yeah. and the work that we're doing. It's uh, all driven by this, the theory and the biophysics. And I think part of the reason why we've been so successful mm -hmm. is because we're bridging those two realms. Oh, wow. So at Kardec's time in the Medium's book, when he describes his journey, he talks about the fact that he saw that when a medium was present, things would happen, the physical events, right? But Correct. he described that you needed the present, whether the medium was conscious about their mediumship or not. Yes, and we don't need that in with the work that we do. They can be there by themselves in the middle of the night, and if they're there, the technology does its work. Oh. So it's like a cell phone. It's nobody else has to be present. You can you can text your on your phone yeah. without anybody else being present, a medium or psychic or your kids or anybody else. You can just make your movements with the keys yeah. and it picks you up. It's the same paradigm of the work that we're doing. Wow. All they have to do is know what they have to do. You know, like, where is the switch and how do they have to move their hands in order to activate it? And then the rest is completely, quote, automatic. Yeah. That's but the goal. I want to ask you a question because, for example, in another book, Heaven and Hell, in which you describe, Kardec was describing, like, cases, his conversations, how he was. And then it's interesting because he says sometimes he lost the connection, not he. 
the medium lost. The, the sphere was no longer there, so it was incomplete. Yes, back again. Does absolutely. Very good point. With this system, the electronic devices are replacing the medium. Yeah. The difference is our cell phones don't get tired like we do. You know, if you're working with your cell phone, you get tired, you start making errors, then you fall asleep, you can't use it at all. Yeah. So our ability to, quote, work with a keyboard or connect with the spirit very much requires our being in the optimal state. The beauty of the technology is it can be in that optimal state 24-7. Oh, wow. So therefore, it eliminates one side of the equation spirit still has to be present and they have to be present in the right way so it's still they have to still be present and they still have to be able to use follow the instructions but once they've learned those instructions the principle is they should be able to use it at least that's the goal that's yeah. the goal of the of going beyond uh requiring us to do so. Now, for the record, some people ask me, they say, well, does that mean that mediums will no longer be needed, needed or be unimportant? And the answer is no. Of course, there's, there's no substitute for the direct capacity to connect with someone or something on the other side, okay? But the truth is, you and I couldn't be having this conversation without the, our technology right now. Mm -hmm. And no matter how connected you and I can be intuitively mm -hmm. and subjectively, this is a piece of cake for us to do. Yes. And it's, it's much harder to be, to do this via, you know, our direct consciousness. So if you're in the physical, which you and I are right now, yeah. it helps to have these tools. It does. But were you able to see different types of spirits coming? Was there a particular category that was most common? Well, you know, it's interesting. Right now, we are very limited in only working with very motivated, very high-level, committed um, beings on the other side. Mixing. Yeah, so, but once we develop, a, should we reach the point, and we think we will, just a matter of time and energy and finances, but should we reach the point where we have what we call the breakthrough level, where it goes from proof of concept to proof of practice, then we can address all of those questions. I see. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, because if if we I I and I like very much when you describe the, the the potential mechanism behind it about the electrons. Because well, that's we, a, yes, right. It's very important because we, we all in spiritism we talk about you know the pair spirit, the spiritual body being the means through which we we can connect into worlds because we all have a spiritual body connected to us, and that's how. It's possible for us to go from this non-material state to connect to the material state because we have this common, this common means. And then now the technology mimicking it somewhat. Yes, that's what we, that's no pun intended, in spirit, what we try to do. Yeah. <laughs> but then I was going to say, Given that, I mean, if we if we think about how do we how how do they show up? Why do they not others? Well, okay, that's a great question. First of all, how they show up is just like with mediumship, meaning when a when a post material person shows up with a medium in a session. Forgetting about how they know to show up and you know why they show up, they appear in a form 
that can be recognizable to the medium, i.e. they're in physical form, they have a face and so on and so forth, but they also appear in a form that can be recognized by their loved ones. So when the medium says, well, I see this, this person's kind of short and she's very thin and she has kind of blondish colored hair cut down to here, the reason why you can recognize that as your daughter is because that's what your daughter looked like. So if you're on the other side and you want a medium, you want your loved ones here to be able to recognize you, you want to show up in a form that you are recognizable to them. And all that energy and information is, according to theory, preserved in the vacuum of space. And that, and that's, and so you bring that. When I do research with Susie Smith, for example, who died when she was, physically died when she was uh, just prior to her 90th birthday, sometimes Susie appears as if she's 60. Sometimes she appears as if she's 40. She, she can appear at, at different ages. She can look at different ages, like different ages. And she even shows up in, in paintings or in sculptures in, at different ages. But they're clearly Susie. And they're not Marilyn Monroe. Or they're not, you know, some other person that, or Princess Diana. They're, they look, she looks like Susie. Now, so they appear in a form that are recognizable to us and, and that's, that's very easy for them to do because it is their essence it's part of their history when they were here also when they appear um and they appear with their spirit body their historical body that is in terms of its energy and its form in the same way that the medium can recognize that completeness and they can wave, they can talk, they can do all the things that they normally do with this body. They then can use this body to interact with our electronic equipment, just like we do. Okay. Um, and the and in our case, because we're, we're working with a team of people, we have mediums who invite specific collaborators to work with the equipment at a particular time. We also teach them to, for example, follow instructions on the computer. So if it's David's turn to now be tested, the computer, remember, all of this is computer automated now. Um, the computer will show up on the screen and it'll say, calling David, calling David on the screen. There'll be a big slide. It's, it's like, like an application. application. Yes. yes. And the computer audibly says, calling on David, calling on David, the experiment will begin soon. Calling on David, calling on David, the experiment will begin soon. So the computer, both audio and visual, tells David, get ready, because now the experiment is beginning for you. And he has, a, we've been previously taught, working with the mediums, that when he sees that, that means it's his time to work with the equipment. And we do the same thing with the other members of the participants. You're working with technology and you depend on technology, but we know how much spirit manifestations also affect it. So how were you affected by it in terms of, you know? Ah, that is such a great, you always ask great questions. Um, our spirit team is very careful not to hurt the equipment. Okay. Okay. Wow. Our spirit team are people who work, have worked with this technology for years and they know to be careful. And they know, so they're not overloading a system. And they're also not trying to make their presence known except through the sensors and the tasks at hand. In other words, they have to follow a precise set of experimental protocols in order for us to work together. And that's why it's a real collaboration. Remember, I don't see or hear a spirit. You know, I'm, a, I'm like Helen Keller. I'm not a medium. Um, the, one of my colleagues, Bob Steck, Dr. <laughs> Bob Steck, called me the Helen Keller of afterlife research. Um, he, uh, anyway, but when apparently when there's a large group of spirit present in the room, 
um, then noise will show up on the amplifier, you know, in the audio, mm. or that we'll have trouble with the. Um, there's some interference, right? There's some interference um, because there's like there's like too many of them, or they're having too good a time, or somebody's playing around just to get noticed, or something like that. But when we're doing our controlled research, uh, we don't have the trouble at all. It's very wow. interesting. It's like they're really careful. It's so interesting. And by the way, mm -hmm. I should say that most of the ideas for the development of this technology is coming from the other side, from the team. Oh, okay. We consider this to be their intellectual property, not ours. Oh, wow. And we protect their intellectual property because once, imagine we actually have a keyboard, which is the first stage of a yeah. cell phone. Before, before visual, before auditory, a binary keyboard is the simplest way to, to yeah. have communication. Once there's a keyboard, once there's a keyboard, then they can communicate just like we can. There's no difference. They can use computers. They can write manuscripts. They can submit patents. They can do anything because it's just a keyboard. It's just that it, it, it strains our imagination to think about this. So they, I don't have to therefore defend them in explaining that this was their intellectual property. It's up to them to do that. Yeah. So they will then communicate using the technology, who they are, what they've done, what is theirs, and so on. Then we have the ethical issue of, yeah. oh, is your spirit is right, okay? Yeah. And how do we expand? So I presume a United States citizen. Yes. Okay, as am I. Now let's imagine we have a, a cell phone, so keyboard, okay. and you and I transition. Yeah. Have we lost our citizenship? Have we now lost our rights? If we, when we interact with our loved ones here back on the planet, um, if, for example, you have an estate, you know, and you and you want to leave your money to your children or your grandchildren, mm -hmm. or you wish to. Um, give it to a charity or whatever, but you're not dead anymore. Do you have a right to make sure that the resources that you created when you were here are actually being followed through with the intentions when you left your will? Um, if you were murdered, mm. but you're now on the other side, should you be allowed to be able to testify at your own trial? Because remember, you can now do so with the soul phone. And then you would be cross-examined just like anyone else would be so that your voice could be heard. Because very often people are killed, but they don't, we don't really know details of what happened and, and so on and so forth. There are so many ethical, moral, legal yes. questions yes. that get raised once the possibility for... Um, this kind of communication becomes valid. And also imagine if we were gonna create, and we are actively um, working this through, um, what you could call an interdimensional cooperation. Oh, wow. Between here and there, in order to coordinate and also protect, so because you don't want the technology abused, to make sure that the technology is being used for the best and highest good, it requires collaboration on both sides. And then the question becomes, um, well, how do you build those, how do you, how do you develop a corporation which is a, a legal spiritual corporation? And the answer is, of course, it's all possible. We just have to have the will and the vision and the caring to do it. The only thing Dr. Schwartz, as our dear friend Paloma is here saying, is what about there is the ethics on this side, on the other side, it's hard to manage it. What about that? Frivolous uh, spirits. The frivolous spirits or malicious spirits. Yeah. Um, as you can probably imagine, I have been concerned with that issue 
from the, my very first con possibility of considering this. We have been told that partly due to the structure of the universe, i.e. in terms of frequency and, um, and uh, stratification, quote, on the other side. And again, this hypothesis is ultimately tested. But they claim is that people who are, quote, at a lower frequency, it's, it's much more difficult to sort of raise your frequency to get to a higher level. Whereas people at a higher level, they can drop down and see a lower level. So if the technology is set to function at a higher level, the frivolous spirits won't have access to it. And they also, A, the, that's why it's an interdimensional corporation. They, on the other side, it's their responsibility to make sure that the technology is, um, is only available. So in fact, and I didn't make this clear, um, at least for the foreseeable future, our plan is not, if all of this unfolds, it is not, quote, quote sell keyboards and just let anybody have a keyboard with any spirit. That would create havoc. What we are doing is having it be more like a um, the early stages of the telephone, where you rented time on a telephone and they were, you had to go through an operator in order to use it. And therefore, the appropriate uh, constraints and are built in so that, uh, so that you minimize, if not eliminate, uh, potential complications from, quote, frivolous spirits or malevolent spirits or people who would wish to abuse it on either side. On either side, exactly. Dr. Schwartz, I know you have to go, but I have to ask you a question. Sure. All of it, all of your books, all of your experiments, and now the latest ones you've, you've just described, does it change the way you feel about death and going back to the afterlife? Does it change anything? Uh, uh, profoundly. Mm. Um, First of all, I do not fear death at all. I have no reason to fear death at all. I am forced to conclude that all of this and more is real. I don't have an excuse not to believe. Okay? There will be a lack of integrity to still doubt. I had to get off the fence of doubt because I was no longer justified in doing so. Otherwise, I'm not being a scientist. I, you have to know, discern, when is the time to change your mind. 